Bitter Side of Sweet, Chapter 20 I have a moment to celebrate the view of their four ankles disappearing into the dark, knowing I've done the right thing, before I'm hauled up by the second man and held firmly in place. With my arms pinned, I can't reach my machete. The man I knocked over pulls himself heavily off the ground. He's younger than I thought with a skinny neck poking out of his uniform collar and bulging eyes. He looks like a cross between a chicken and a frog. When he's on his feet, he cuffs me in the face. The one, that's, who's, the one who's holding my arms, older by the sound of his voice, rumbles out a question to the younger one in the language I don't understand. That must be what French sounds like when you're angry. The younger one, frog face, cranes his head to see out the gate, then answers with an angry shrug. Clearly, they got away. Frog face swings the big metal gate shut and padlocks it from the inside. Something tightens in my chest when I hear the lock click. I'm not sure if it's anger or fear. Then he asks me a question, but he's still not speaking the language I understand, so I just shake my head. You! The man behind me asks in Bambara, giving me a little shake that pulls uncomfortably on my shoulders. What were you doing here, huh? I'm surprised to hear him speaking my language, but I still don't answer him. Frogface cuffs me again, and now I can taste blood in my mouth. Answer my uncle, you street rat. He also switches to Bambara. What were you doing here? I glare at him. He hits me again. Stop hitting him, the uncle says, and I'm grateful. It doesn't take much getting hit in the head to make you dizzy, and I need to not feel that way if I'm going to escape. Why? He could be a spy. The older man laughs, and I feel his grip loosen slightly. I tense, waiting for the opportunity to run like crazy. If I were to slam my head into the uncle's face, I could probably outrun Frogface. I consider reaching for my machete again but I see the gun at his belt, and I reconsider. There's no way to outrun a bullet. A spy, says the uncle behind me. You watch too much television, you and those friends of yours. Who would he be spying for? In other company? In other country? Look at him, he's skinny as a dog, and his hands and feet are like rocks. He doesn't even speak French. He's just a poor working boy from the north. The nephew scowls, fingering his gun. We still need to know why he's here, he grouses. The uncle lets go of one of my arms and turns me so that I'm facing him. He is square and solid. There's not much resemblance to his cold-blooded frog of a nephew. I'm of a mind to let you go, but you need to tell me what you are doing here, he says, looking into my eyes. His eyes have rings of tiredness around around them, and his voice is patient. A quick image of Omar standing off to the side of his idling truck, talking to a wall while we walked away, flashes through my mind. For the first time, I wonder if I can get out of this by using words. It feels really uncomfortable, trusting so much. First Khadija, then Omar, and now this guard. But I look at him with the most honest expression I can muster and I tell him the truth, mostly. We were tired of walking, so we hitched a ride on one of the trucks, but then we fell asleep while we were in it. We woke up to the sound of the gate closing. We got out of the truck but didn't know how to get through the gate, so we decided to run out the next time a truck came in. And why did you run into me instead of around me? Frogface demands. We were afraid of getting caught, and you were blocking the gate. I ran into you so my brother and uh, my sister would be able to get out. For a moment, they just stare at me, taking in my story and my rough hands. Where were you coming from? asked the uncle. A little farm outside of Men. I lie, giving the name of the district where the cacao farm was located. I hope that these men will accept that my lack of French comes from being a backwater kid instead of from being Malian. No one here loves a foreigner. And why did you come to San Pedro? To see my aunt? But my tone goes up at the end, betraying the lie for what it is. I close my mouth. Let the nephew think I'm a spy if he will. 
but I'm not going to tell him that I'm a runaway from one of the farms that supply them with their job. What? Why? What are you not telling us? The nephew is in my face again, shouting. My pleasant look melts without my permission, and I find myself scowling. The uncle's voice cuts into our fight. You have a lot of scars, he says quietly. Were you a plantation boy? My stomach feels like it's dropped out of me. No, I say louder than I mean to, but the uncle's looking at me with old eyes, and I know I can't leave it at that. I flick my gaze along my own arms. Yes, you can see the lines left there by the bosses. I just don't think about them very much. On my legs, too, I guess, but hopefully it's too dark to see them. Um, my uncle made us work for him on his farm near men. He, um, was not a patient man, so, um, that's why we're running here to live with our aunt, I say. For a moment, the big man and I look at each other, and I know he knows I'm lying, but then he lets go of my arm. It feels cold where he was gripping it, and for a moment, we all stand there, frozen by the surprise of what he did. I had an uncle like that once, he says softly and rolls up his shirt sleeve. Old machete cuts trace a light web on his dark arms, and chemical burns dot his hands. Those hands were cacao at some point, too. After a moment, he walks to the metal gate, unclips the padlock, and holds it open his shoulder's width. Be on your way, but I warn you, you and your family better not come back in here. We'll turn you over to the police next time. I'm out of the crack in that gate like a fish through fingers before I pause. A thin slice of light spills from the inside. The nephew looks angry. I can tell he wants to argue with his uncle, and there's a calculating look on his face that makes me feel deeply uncomfortable. I know I should get a move on before they change their minds, but I make myself wrestle the rarely used thanks off my tongue. I Nietzsche, I say to the uncle behind the closing gate. Be safe, comes the soft reply a second before the gate clangs shut and the street is plunged into darkness. I stand there for a second more, wandering at it all, but then I come to my senses and run away as fast as my legs will carry me. I've only made it a few meters when two forms hurtle out of the shadows to my left and barrel into me. Amadou! Sadu shouting, grabbing me. Both of Khadija's arms are thrown on my, around my neck. Yeah, don't choke me, I manage to get out. She lets go immediately and steps away, grinning. I'm just so glad to see you, she says. We thought, we thought, Sadu gasps, still attached to my waist like a lichen, that they were going to kill you or give you to the police, and then we, we were standing here fighting, and I said, we need to get in there and save Amadou, and she said, no, we need to go get help, and then I said, what if he makes it out and we're gone? And then she said, Sadu, okay, okay, I say, pushing him off and laughing in spite of myself. I made it out fine. I look gratefully between my brother and the wildcat, and I'm glad you waited for me. I hug, I hug him against my side and smile at her. It feels good to be back with them. Now that I'm here, though, we really should get off these dark streets as quickly as possible before something else happens. I agree, Khadijah says. Come on, let's see if we can find the house where I was staying. We wander the streets for almost an hour. Khadijah's excitement seems to override her nervousness about nighttime kidnappers and pushes her forward. But once we put a few blocks between ourselves and the big metal gate, Sadu's terror no longer drives him. He's stumbling along miserably, tripping over his feet and holding his arm. Through it all, he keeps his lips firmly pressed together, not complaining. I've learned over the past few days that Sado, Sado can do more on less strength than I ever thought. Even so, there comes a point where I can't take it, where I can't take seeing him struggle. Khadija, we need to stop. What? She looks at me, anger creasing her face. We made it all the way to San Pedro, and you want to stop? Yes, Sadu's weight slumps against me. We need to. She glances at Sadu, and her eyebrows crumple together. Okay, she sighs. 
I point with my chin to a vacant lot a little ways farther on. How about there? I ask. Ugh, no, says Khadijah. There could be snakes or broken glass or drug, de drug dealers in there. Drug dealers? Like the antibiotics? Khadijah looks at me as if my stupidity were a hideous rash she can't quite bear the sight of. No, Amadou, drug dealers. People who are selling illegal drugs and will kill you for interrupting a deal. I look at the wild grass and scraggly bushes. Snakes only come out in the sunlight. And though Sadu and I have no shoes, our bare feet are so callous, we probably wouldn't even notice if there were broken glass. As to drug dealers, well... Where would you rather be unsafe, I ask? In the street, in this lot, or at the docks? Because unless you have a better idea of where we can go and be perfectly happy and comfortable, then I think we should get some sleep while we can. Khadijah hesitates. What's wrong, city girl? I say in an ugly voice. Aren't you glad to be home? That's all it takes. One unpleasant word and the scared girl is gone. A wild cat glares at me instead. Ah, you have no idea what you're getting into. Fine, we'll sleep here for the night, but we're going to take turns keeping watch with your machete, and if anyone comes by, we run. Fine, I say, pulling my machete out of my belt and using it to part the long grass. I wave her into the vacant lot. Your snake-infested, broken glass-lined, drug dealer paradise is waiting for you. Khadijah practically snarls as she stomps past me. I wink at Sadu, who's looking at me curiously. Well, I whisper, she went in, didn't she? Sadu shakes his head. You're bad, Amadou, he says with a laugh, holding the long grass aside with his one hand. My brother stumbles in after her, not seeming concerned about snakes, broken glass, or drug dealers, when it means he can finally get some sleep. I guess I am, I say, and follow the two of them into the vacant lot, smoothing the grass behind me. We don't sleep well that night. Though there are no snakes or drug dealers, and there's some broken glass as well as cans, wrappers, and other trash that I have to clear away before any of us can lie down. And there are ants, the biting kind. After a few attempts to brush them off, we give up and walk on, hiding in the shadows of the buildings, staying off the main streets and collapsing in empty doorways for a few stolen minutes of sleep when we can. One of us always stands guard with a machete when we stop, because even though I've made fun of Khadijah, I can't shake the feeling that someone might be following us. It's the tiny hours in the morning, and, and it's my turn to stay awake when I find that I'm right. Khadijah and Sadu are slumped against the wall in a small alley, and I'm sitting in front of them, machete across my knees trying to stay awake when I get the feeling again. It's like ants are crawling up my neck, but this time they're inside my skin. I don't know who's watching us, but I can feel the eyes on me. I squint up and down the dark street. Was that a twitch of movement in the doorway there? Did I hear the noise of a footfall? My tired eyes and ears are playing tricks on me. I find myself gripping my machete handle so tightly my knuckles ache. Then I see him. A young man in a guard's uniform slinking toward us. It's too dark to be sure, but he looks an awful lot like the nephew from the docks. Why is he following us? I don't know the answer and I don't want to find out. I consider what to do. I don't want to be caught, but I doubt Sadu has the energy left to run again. Even though we're not blocked in, I feel trapped. I do the only thing I can. I step out into the open, machete held high, and face him. When the nephew sees me, he stops. There are barely a few meters between us, and I can see the bulge at his hip, where his gun is. I only have my machete, but I don't back down. The nephew holds my eyes only for a moment, then glances to where Khadijah and Sadu are sleeping behind me. He fumbles in his pocket and takes out a small piece of plastic. He holds it up and presses a button. A little light flashes and there's a clicking sound. He turns around and jogs away, leaving me standing in the empty moonlight alley, pointing my machete at nothing but shadows. Of all the things I was expecting, this was not one of them. 
I wait for him to come back. I wait for the sound of a shot and the feeling of blood pouring out of me. Finally, I can't take the silence anymore. I jostle Khadijah and say to awake. Let's go, I say. What? Why? Khadijah mumbles sleepily. I think someone's following us. That wakes her up. She looks at me with a pure look of terror. Who? She whispers. I glance at her face and decide this is not an extra fear she needs right now. I change what I was about to say. Probably no one. I help Sadu to his feet. I just have a creepy feeling, and I don't want to stay in one place too long in this town at night. I attempt to smile, but I don't think it comes across. Maybe it's one of your drug dealers. Khadijah swallows hard, then gets to her feet. But all her muscles are tight, so I don't think she buys my explanation. Her eyes cut from side to side, checking every street, window, and doorway for her kidnappers. Stumbling with exhaustion, we carry Sadu through a maze of streets until I'm sure the nephew can't get to us again. Hours later, Dawn finds us huddled together in the shadows underneath the parked truck. We're invisible to anyone passing by, and it's allowed Sadu a few hours of unbroken sleep. But I keep jolting awake to nightmares of getting run over. Once it's light enough to see, the three of us are off again, though this time Khadijah is not nearly excited as she was before. Even though she doesn't know about Frogface, she hasn't been the same since I said someone might be following us. Now, with daylight beginning to filter between the buildings, we trace our tired way, looking for landmarks Khadijah recognizes. Finally, we find them. Even so, it's nearly noon when we're standing in front of a tall metal door set into a stucco wall, considering it. I look up and down the street, expecting hordes of men, led by the nephew from the docks, to jump out at us. But it's eerily silent. Khadijah turns to me. Should I knock? she asks. I shrug. Your house, I say as lightly as I can. You're right, she says. It's only going to be Stefan or Sandrine or Mama. There's nothing to be afraid of, right? I give her a thin-lipped smile. She pounds her fist against the door, causing a hollow clanging that makes us all wince. Almost instantly, a small section of the door screeches open to reveal a hard, pitted face with a crooked nose. It must be the Stefan she mentioned. There's a second of silence. I look at Khadijah. Only because I know her so well can I tell that she's terrified. Who are you? she asks.